Hello, this is Justin Cates, Director of Emergency Management for the City of Nashville, New Hampshire, and also a board member at the National Alliance for Public Safety, GIS, NAPSIG Foundation. And I'm going to welcome you to our session on rapid improvement as part of the INSPIRE uh, session on uh, project management, project design, and project development. And with me uh, today, I have Emily Marticello, who is a Continuous Improvement Advisor for FEMA Region 1 uh, and has really developed a lot of the tools that we'll talk about uh, today as part of this interview. Thanks, Emily, for joining us. Thanks for having me on. So first of all, tell us a little bit about the FEMA rapid improvement process and, and what project management processes is it really derived from? Where does it come from? Yeah, absolutely. So the FEMA rapid improvement process was developed uh, last year during COVID as we were working on a method to quickly implement change uh, while we had an ongoing response operation. And for this, what we really wanted to do is to design a simple and quick method for moving our ideas to action. We wanted to address challenges we were having immediately because we had an ongoing response that we needed to improve how we were handling it, knowing that there was uh, the probability of a resurgence and a second wave, which we did see. So we also understood that whole scale changes take a lot of time. So while we have our continuous improvement program uh, that I run, we also needed to implement rapid improvement. So we borrowed from a lot of the concepts um, in project management, because in order to move quickly, you need to be organized. Uh, so we use different concepts like stakeholder engagement, really in order to implement change quickly, you have to have buy-in and ownership from your stakeholders. We also use different communication tools and methods that project management often uses, like the RACI concept, uh, which was really helpful in ensuring that decision makers, as well as those who are part of the process are informed on what changes are being made. And then we used a lot of the different planning tools you would use when you're managing a project and specifically in rapid improvement, we use backwards planning so that we can accomplish the rapidness of the improvement in the short window of time that we have. Cool. So um, I think one of the things that a lot of organizations are, are going to ask is how do they use this, you know, and, and really um, for the folks that are participating in Spire, we've got a mixture of technologists, but also decision makers. Um, you know, can this process be used to resolve some sort of a, an issue with a technology service or solution uh, during the middle of an incident? Yeah, absolutely. And I think after you're going to share some of the tools and templates we created, as well as the training guides that we used uh, to kind of share our rapid improvement uh, methodology with others. But what I would say are the two most important ingredients, if you will, to having a successful rapid improvement project is having a shared goal and a sense of urgency. And those two things are interrelated. So when we were coming up with the rapid improvement uh, process, our mantra or our shared goal was rapid improvement in anticipation of a second wave. What we were trying to do was rally everyone around making improvements with a clear target and a clear goal. We're trying to be better in our response to a second wave of COVID, but we also have a second wave and that gave us our, our urgency. I think that could be done with any type of project. And when we were delivering our pilot training course, we had folks who were looking at um, all types of emergency management related and just you know private sector continuity related projects that were or were not related to COVID. And the interesting thing was the timeline in which folks were trying to make improvement spanned from you know a week to maybe we say like under three months is really that rapid improvement window. Um, and I think again, the key is creating that shared goal and that should drive the sense of urgency. Without that, you're, you're really just looking more at you know long-term change management and continuous improvement, which you still can do. And again, as part of what I said earlier, that's still going on. There are uh, issues that you can't resolve immediately, uh, but there are short-term wins that you can put in place and that's that rapid improvement. And then your continuous improvement program is overarching and is looking to address systemic or whole change issues that need to be kind of more planned out and take a longer event horizon to achieve. 
So I think that'll probably be one of the big questions that an organization would look at when they're uh, exploring the rapid improvement process is, is really what's, what makes this different from the traditional um, after action reporting process that we see after disaster where you're essentially spending tons and tons of time going through and doing interviews and creating reports and improvement plans and you know years go by what, what what's really the big difference and why I would use this versus uh, the traditional process yeah and I think it might not be an either or but an understanding of how, where each one plays a role so for us uh, in FEMA region one we looked at the rapid improvement uh, method as our immediate process improvement. What are the immediate actions we are going to take because we have an urgent goal in front of us that we must achieve, but we also understood there are some larger scale changes that might require things as challenging as legislation that are not rapid in their, uh, you know, process. And there, we also understood that you know, small incremental changes do add up and would make our response better in the near term, even if there was a larger change that we wanted to implement, it would be better to do something than nothing. So I, it really complements each other. Now, for every, you know, short term suggestion we got, we also collected those longer term suggestions that would take a while to build out or implement, maybe they needed resources, they needed money. They needed time. That's kind of the, the biggest commodity we were short on was time. Uh, so, so that's where I looked at, okay, we have our continuous improvement program that oversaw everything. And we funneled all those longer term solutions into our continuous improvement working group, just like a traditional after action would. But we didn't have this, oh, the thing's over, the event's done. We can take our time to solve these problems we said, mm, this is an ongoing cyclical thing. We continue to have to deal with the COVID response. Let's implement these immediate improvements. Um, and like I said, to us, rapid improvement was something that took less than three months to implement. So let's walk through this process. Um, really the, the first thing that you, you note in, in the documents that we'll be sharing on the, on the page is that you really need to identify a desired outcome of this process. Uh, how does an organization, I mean, it seems obvious that they're just gonna say, well, this is what I wanna do, but how do they you know, come up with consensus as to what that outcome looks like? And do you do any like pre-surveys or anything like that as part of that? Yeah, absolutely. So I think this is the real integral part is having, uh, like you would in project management, your project sponsor or your leader really help shape what is the goal, what is the outcome, what are we trying to achieve. If we're on the same page uh, with what we're trying to achieve, we are going to have the support from leadership to put the resources, time, energy, money behind achieving that goal. So you need to set yourself up for success with rapid improvement and set that goal that leadership is backing and is trying to drive you know, the whole organization towards achieving that goal. Um, the other thing that I want to say is that it needs to be well scoped. So like any good project, you need to have a clearly defined scope. And if you're trying to do something quickly, you can't do everything. Um, and there was a lot of things when we were looking at our goal of rapid improvement and anticipation of the second wave that were for future pandemics. There was lots of things we would want to do differently next time. And we're going to save those for next time. And we're going to work it. We're going to focus on this time. What are we doing for this second wave? Um, and that was really important because you don't want to stop the brainstorming and you don't want to stop the thinking. But if you don't focus it, you'll never get out of that phase of, you know, the creative thinking of what solutions we should put in place. So the goal, starting with the goal, spending the time to shape that goal up front gives you your kind of guide guiding post to get you to that rapid uh, improvement or that sense of urgency. It has to be clearly defined. People have to understand why we're doing this and what we're all driving towards. That makes sense. And after they've come up with that shared goal, that, that, that the desired outcome, uh, you recommend that you hold a, a rapid improvement after action workshop. What takes place during this specific workshop? 
Yes. So as you mentioned in the uh, previous question, we did a pre-survey. So once we had our goal, we did a pre-survey of all of our stakeholders around what are those challenges or really opportunities we have as we look towards rapid improvement in anticipation of our goal. And by doing this pre-survey, we were able to gather a lot of themes and insights into what folks, our stakeholders, um, our partners felt were the areas of most importance where we could make uh, rapid change. And that was key for, for the whole entire process. We didn't ask broad questions. We didn't ask questions that would lead us towards solutions that were not implementable quickly. We really keep the focus of the questions and the inquiry around the rapid improvement. What would this look like ideally in the second wave or in whatever X goal you have going forward? So that survey brings together those themes and then the after action workshop, the rapid improvement workshop brings together those stakeholders to continue kind of borrowing from, from some design thinking concepts to continue to brainstorm and diverge in their thinking around what are these issues what really should we be focusing on in the second wave? All of that comes together to kind of really uh, paint a picture of what are those major buckets that we should be focusing our energy on. And that's where you kind of move into the next part of the rapid improvement, which is an improvement planning workshop. And in our training, we also allow for a method where you can combine those two because that's the rapid, rapid improvement version of it. And we did that as well. And that works better for smaller teams. But when you're trying to get broad consensus, uh, as we were, we had a couple hundred stakeholders. We broke them up in two groups so we can really make sure we, uh, again, at the after action workshop, collected everybody's items. And then in the improvement planning workshop, we went into a convergence where we started to narrow in on those issues, but from the lens of the solution. So the improvement planning workshop really delves into the courses of action and really what is the desired outcome for each one of these uh, opportunities or issues we're having. And that's where the subject matter experts can take those things back and implement those courses of action that are going to rapidly achieve the solution needed uh, to address that issue. So uh, both this after action, uh, the rapid improvement after action workshop, and then this uh, improvement planning workshop. Uh, during COVID, you had to do all of this stuff virtually. Were there uh, any best practices that you 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 know, saw out of those virtual opportunities to to do these workshops on how to facilitate, how to uh, you know, engage with the audience? What approaches were you using to to do that in a virtual environment? Yeah, that was a very unique aspect of it, but I felt like it actually gave way to other different methods of kind of asynchronous participation in the workshop. Um, so we tried to use as many different technology tools as we could, uh, either during the workshop or before the workshop. So there's a lot of different uh, live surveying and polling tools uh, that we used. We also heavily relied on the different features um, in the plat the virtual platform we used to uh, either whiteboard or um, use the chat function, uh, did different um, emojis to signal different things. So we really took advantage of all the different methods that people could kind of contribute to the discussion. But the other thing we did was we tried to prime some of the discussion by engaging stakeholders directly ahead of the workshops to ensure they understood some of the focus areas and could kind of bring forward and illustrate some of the themes with real experiences. So, you know, when you're having a large workshop with hundreds of people, you need to keep it organized and allow people to speak but also um, understand that you don't have all the time in the world to hear from everyone. So it was really important to us to make sure that uh, all different types of stakeholders got to be heard in the workshop, but that there were other ways to be heard besides literally speaking. We were able to capture things through, again, the survey tools, through the chat, um, other functions. That way there wasn't just one representation of uh, a problem. We were able to hear it from multiple sides and as well as hear from different solutions. So I really encourage people to look at all the different technology tools available to them. 
but it's also um, takes a village to manage those kind of things. So for each of our workshops, we broke up into smaller groups and even the smaller groups had about three people managing just that one element of the breakout. Wow. I, I think that it is like a really awesome thing that you can have 200 people um, on one of these workshops and you can hear from so many different voices. Whereas if you were physically in a conference space, you would really only be able to hear from one person at a time if you were lucky and you had a microphone. Uh, so that was really cool, but it also presented challenges. Um, I think the other cool thing about it is our ability to kind of crowdsource the note taking and the recording of it. Um, instead of having, you know, so many note takers, the group itself, you know, recorded a lot of our notes and key points by using the chat and whiteboard features. So that was kind of really neat to see. And then by using the surveys and the other, you know, live polling tools, that kind of distributes some of the work of documenting and capturing the ideas that come out of the workshop. That makes sense. So this uh, improvement planning workshop, which is the second in the series, or it could be combined if you if you uh, were sort of on a short time scale. Uh, in that uh, workshop, you're working to build consensus on what solutions would achieve the goal. What happens after you validate those courses of action that, that or come up with during that workshop and, and really how are you tracking implementation as you move into the future? Yeah, I think the most important part of the uh, rapid improvement starts immediately after the workshops. And in order to do this, you need to have engaged in these workshops, the folks who will end up being the kind of responsible uh, task owner for different courses of action. So we had as many of our stakeholders engaged in the workshop so that they could hear directly from the participants about the challenges and courses of action. And even before we closed out the workshop, I had emails about things people were already starting to work on. So um, really creating that sense of urgency, but empowering everyone to immediately take action is a key part of rapid improvement. If you have to do it kind of like a traditional after action where you have to write everything out, task everybody, have a meeting about every single individual a course of action, this is not gonna happen rapidly. So you need people to be empowered up front to hear the problem, understand the outcome that we're trying to achieve and then let them go with the solution. And that's really important is not to prescribe the how, but understand what the why, what are we What are we trying to get to and allow the practitioners to come up with those solutions that are gonna achieve our goal in the short period of time we have. I think the other important thing we did after the workshop is we hold, held weekly and even more frequently than that uh, meetings with our continuous improvement working group, which was then solely focused on rapid improvement. And we had our leadership on that call. When, when anyone reported out on a barrier, the barrier was immediately addressed in that meeting so that everyone had the time, the staff, the resources they needed to implement that solution. And that led to a lot of creative solutions. Um, and it also led to the pooling of resources to kind of achieve a, a shared goal. Um, so that's the other part is that these tasks are not to be undertaken um, independently or in silos. We were able to kind of cross pollinate a lot of our solutions and make them stronger after hearing what each other was trying to achieve. Uh, uh, folks are willing to chip into different solutions uh, so we could accomplish them all. And it was really impressive to see um, the after action report, the summary that came out actually documented the solutions, not the problems. And that was a key part of closing the feedback loop with, uh, with everybody was continuing communicating where we were at on implementing solutions to the identified challenges and then making sure we reported back with a final report that demonstrated the kind of closeout or implementation of all of the solutions that were brought up in the workshop. That makes sense. So FEMA has people who are doing work in continuous improvement, dedicated staff. Uh, most agencies and organizations um, in the public sector, in most cases, don't have that type of, of resource. So who's responsible for facilitating this process within the organization? And 
um, you know, if it's a collateral duty, uh, what are the, the skills that are necessary in order for somebody to lead this type of an endeavor? Yeah, so I think ultimately, you know, all change and improvement is the responsibility of leadership and leadership really needs to be invested in um, making changes to uh, improve their organization's readiness, preparedness, whatever they're trying to do. So it, it needs to come from leadership. The direction needs to come from leadership. Now, I think, um, you know, anyone skilled in any sort of uh, process improvement, change management, project management, honestly change is something we all experience and all have to deal with as part, part of our normal work. Um, can be kind of trained on a method uh, that their agency wants to use, whether it's the rapid improvement method or another method, um, and can take the this task on. I think you have to be a pretty motivated person. Um, you have to clearly understand what leadership is trying to achieve so that you can kind of funnel everybody's energy towards that so you actually have the support and resources. Um, I think when we talk about the emergency management field, it ends up a lot of the time being folks who are in the training and exercise or preparedness side of the house as uh, they end up being the folks who either understand HSHEEP, the Homeland Security um, and Exercise Evaluation Program, or they do training or they do, you know, kind of preparedness assessments and reports. Anyone who does evaluation um, can understand these basic concepts. Or I would say if there's anybody in your organization that has uh, a project management background, this is just a project to improve. I mean, that's really kind of what it boils down to. You you have a timeline, you have a goal. You're you're building out the uh, elements of your plan as you go, as you discover them, as you go. But I, I think it just takes a well-organized person. But I would say that the first responsibility lies on leadership to kind of direct this to happen um, and, and set that sense of urgency. It's really hard for anyone to set like a, a deadline, uh, but for leadership, um, they can set a clear goal target to kind of rally the whole organization around. But I would say that if you are working on a project and you're the project manager, or this goal is totally within your scope, I mean, you can set this for yourself or your team. This is something that can be used on a small scale within a small team or it could be used as we did at a large scale, kind of across our whole organization and really across the whole New England enterprise to kind of move the whole community in a rapid improvement direction. So to kind of close us out, um, since we've talked about some of the resources that, that you've used um, within FEMA to you know, implement this process, for those that are, are looking and interested in, in also adopting this as a, an approach to rapidly improve a, a solution during a, a crisis, um, what resources would you recommend uh, public safety or emergency management look at uh, when, they, when they move forward to the next step on this? Yeah, so we're going to share the resources that we have on Prep Toolkit. Uh, which is kind of FEMA's hub for a lot of preparedness documents. I really encourage everyone to get an account because there's a lot of resources on there, but we have the continuous improvement community of practice. So there's a lot of continuous improvement resources in there. And then we have the whole toolkit on the rapid improvement process. When, when my team and I kind of worked on building out the rapid improvement process, I tried to borrow from the most simple concepts of other change management tools I had. So looked at the kind of fundamentals of project management. So if you can take a fundamentals of project management, those skills are going to come in handy when you're trying to manage something quickly. Um, I also have a background in lean as a lean black belt. There's a lot of concepts in there about I really identifying um, waste, which is really easy to remove quickly. Another easy improvement is to get rid of things you don't need and you automatically, things are better. Uh, so try to borrow from some of those concepts. I know you're gonna do another session on design thinking. I think that's another way to bring, borrow some of those concepts into how we ran the workshops uh, to allow people to both uh, diverge in their thinking and then converge in their thinking. Uh, to kind of lead us towards consensus. So any of the kind of change management uh, practices you can think of, borrow from them. 
uh, take what is simplest and easiest to implement. And that's how we pull together our rapid improvement process. I also think it's important to work within your organization's kind of culture and structure. Um, that's going to be the uh, path of least resistance to achieve something rapidly. So, you know, understanding the organizational construct we already had in FEMA and leveraging our continuous improvement working group, then we didn't have to recreate something. So whatever uh, your organization has um, as pathways towards change, you also want to marry those up with the different rapid improvement concepts. But definitely check out Prep Toolkit. Um, and we'll have the resources up there. And I know we'll share the link to those resources as part of this chat. Perfect. Yeah, so that'll be uh, something that all of you can take a look at on this page will be the links to Prep Toolkit as well as all the rapid improvement templates. Um, that's a good first step for you as you look to try and implement this type of a solution. Emily, thanks a lot for your time uh, and talking to the Inspire attendees. And hopefully they'll take some of these resources and implement them during their next emergency. Thanks. Thank you.